So when I look in the room and I see the people here and I look mentally, virtually at the people who are uh, on the teams, do you know what I see? I see a whole bunch of people with unlimited potential. Unlimited, right? Now, let's think about something. What is one of the things, most incredible things that mankind has accomplished in the past 100 years? Something that seems almost like science fiction before it happened. What has humanity done that just seems like, wow, you would have thought, like, you never could do that before? AI. Yeah. AI earlier. Phones even earlier. Think Going about the, the what's that? Going to the moon. Going to the moon. Ding, ding, ding. Right? Think about that. Who would have thought that we could put a human being on the moon? Think about all the challenges and think about all the things that would have to happen. And who did that? People like us. Right? Regular human beings. Regular minds. So the people in this room and sitting, uh, you know, in their offices, home offices, have unlimited potential. So I'm going to use that as a metaphor to talk about executive presence and why it's important. So before we get kicked off, I want to show you how I view all of you. And there we are, on the moon. How did we do that? How did we get there, right? And you see the flames coming out, right? The rocket fuel, so we're gonna use that as a metaphor today. So each one of you inside of you has a spark that's different than anyone else's spark, right? That's, that's you, that's the essence, that's Donna, that's Elisa, that's Chris, that's Phil, right? No one else has that, that's the spark, right? However, we all know just the spark doesn't do much. What else do you need besides the spark? You. Team. Team. People. Yeah. You need fuel, right? I heard someone say fuel. And what is the fuel? The fuel is the effort, right? It's all the things you produce. It's all the blood, sweat, and tears you put in. Because just that spark, if it's not action, it doesn't create anything. However, there's a third and essential ingredient. You have the spark. You have the fuel. But what else do you need? Right, if anyone knows about combustion and engines, what do you need in addition to the spark and the fuel? Air. Air. Oxygen. Right? Very good. Then. So, in a rocket, when they go into space, is there oxygen in space? No. So they actually add something called an oxidizer, which is essentially air that's added to the mix because there is no air in space, right? That would stink to get up to space and you can't get back because you go to light the engine and nothing happens because there's no air. So for us, the air, and oxygen is a good way to describe it, is opportunities, right? You could be the best painter, the best singer, the best programmer, the best speaker, the best program manager. If you don't get the opportunities for your spark and efforts, then you don't end up on the moon, you end up still on the ground, right? Doesn't mean you don't have it, doesn't mean you don't put in the efforts, but without the opportunities, you are never going to be able to go all the way. So that's when we talk about executive presence. Because executive presence essentially gets you those opportunities, right? Because it gets you the opportunity to do more than you're doing now, and that's how we grow, and that's how you go from being someone who started out at NASA, you know, maybe at a desk, to being the administrator of NASA. Do you know what the administrator is of NASA? What position that is? Equivalent to a corporation? They're the CEO. Right? It's called the administrator of NASA, but essentially they are the CEO. So, what is an executive? Why does someone get to be an executive? Right? Folks in 75. What essentially makes someone an executive? High level, High level of decision making, yes. And why is that important? Why? To guide the ship. Or, or... Yeah, to guide the ship. And where's the ship going? Hopefully, to some 
success. <laughs> the ship is going where the company or the board wants it to go. Right? We hire the executive that we think is going to get the organization where it wants to go. There could be someone equally as far, equally as talented, but they're headed in that direction. We want the guy or the gal, right? Who's going to take us the way the company wants to go. The medieval Latin root for executive comes from execu, which means to carry out. So at its simplest, all an executive is is someone who carries things out, who gets things done. That's why you get to be the VP or the director and not someone else. Because the people who are deciding believe you have the best chance of getting it done. Keep in mind, it's before you've done it. Right? You typically get the job before you've done it. It's a leap of faith on the people who are deciding. So to have executive presence, you have to first understand what an executive is. As someone who gets things done, carries things out. Now, it's not called the executive doing. It's called executive presence, right? Why is it called executive presence? Why is it called executive presence, not executive doing? Sorry? Yeah, because people feel you have that ability, right? So when they walk into the room, when they see you talking, they're like, wow, that person, I believe they can do it versus the person who's like, maybe. Right? Like, no one's going to hire that person to steer the ship, right? They want to hire the person that says, all right, we're going to figure it out, we're going to do it together as a team. And you know, we all have presence meters, right? When you walk into a room, Donna, and someone's sad, do they have to tell you they're sad? No. How do you know? No, we already have those tools inside us as human beings. If we didn't, we'd be in a lot of trouble. Imagine there's a bully at school and they're having a bad day. You walk up to them and you're like, hey, I knew it. How's that going to end for you? <laughs> right? It's a survival tactic. Right? We have to understand how other people are doing. And that's presence. We feel the state of being or presence of a person. And that's why all executive presence is, and I have a definition here, it's the ability to inspire confidence that you can lead well in a given situation. That's all it is. Do people believe? that you can lead well in this specific situation, right? Just because you can fight a fire doesn't mean you can race a car, doesn't mean you can run an organization that saves you know, dogs that have been you know, abandoned, right? Those are different things. But in that particular situation, do people have confidence? Now, why do they have confidence in you versus someone else? What is it that gives people confidence? Think about presence, executive presence. So what, what gives people confidence that this person should be nominated or promoted versus this other person. Well, I think it's probably the ability to to articulate that strategy and strategy. Exactly. So what Phil said for those of you who couldn't hear, the ability to articulate the strategy and show the experience and that all plays into having that presence, right? Because as you do that, Right? What Phil was saying, as you do that, if you do it kind of like without confidence, then people won't believe it. Right? You can say all the right bullet points, but if people don't believe it's really coming from you, like you're just an actor, and they hired you, and you're just reading a script, no one's going to believe it. So these are what I like to call the six degrees of executive presence. There's more than six, right? but this helps us understand what type of states of being we expect to see in our lives. Right? So I'm not going to go over all of them in depth, but fit a couple of them, like proactive. Right? If you're the type of leader that waits until bad things happen and aren't preparing for anything, then people aren't going to want to follow you for very long. Uh, equanimity, that's another one of my favorites. If something goes wrong, right? equanimity is just a fancy way of saying cool under pressure, cool under fire. If something goes wrong and you're the leader and you're like, oh, I got to go, <laughs> and you leave, Right? Because you're freaking out. You go to your car and you hyperventilate when the troops need you to like settle everything down. People aren't going to want to follow you much more either. And the last part I'll share just for today is confidence. If you don't have confidence in yourself, it becomes very difficult to inspire confidence in others. So for this part of the presentation, I just want people to understand, often we think of 
executive presences, oh, I have to dress a certain way, I have to talk a certain way, I have to look a certain way, right? Those things are what I like to call trappings, right? They're like symbols or shortcuts, but true executive presence comes from your state of being and how you operate as things go on. That's what people feel, and then they, they see the outward manifestation, but really it comes from inside. It's your state of being. So you can look really great, but that may only last until you actually have to open your mouth or leave. And then people will realize, oh my gosh, this person doesn't know what they're doing. Because your state of being is the one that inspires confidence that you can be one. But there's a problem. I like to call this the Tom Brady problem. Nothing uh, personal against Tom Brady. I'm not a huge football person, so I don't like him or dislike him in any particular way. But most people will agree he's one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. And when it comes to executive presence, he looks the part. And a lot of us in this room, we don't, right? So imagine you go into a boardroom and you're dressed up and some dude walks in who looks exactly like Tom Brady. Who is everybody gonna think is in charge, right? Without any other information, of course, they think the Tom Brady person is in charge. So that can be a challenge, an obstacle for executive presence for everyone who doesn't look like Tom Brady. Right? Not insurmountable, we're going to talk about what that means and how to deal with it, but just to recognize that it's not a level playing field, not everyone is starting from the same assumptions. Right? You're tall, right? tall, male, good looking, right? automatically people sort of have associations of leadership. Here's a great quote. It turns out that to have a level playing field, you have to go out and search for candidates who can compete. And there is no shortage of minority candidates who can compete for these jobs. It's not that they get overlooked, they don't get looked, period. This is from Dick Parsons, former CEO of Time Warner and chairman of Citigroup. So someone who knows a little bit about leadership, right, at the highest level. For those of you who are more visual, right? This purple block here represents this statistic, right? 88.8% of CEOs, CFOs, and COOs are Caucasian, and 88.1% are men, right? So that's the base that we're starting from. This is from uh, 2022, they did a survey of Fortune 500, some of the S&P 500, about six or 700 of those organizations. Now, do you see the bottom under the purple square? Do you see what I wrote there? No, you can't see it, because it's invisible, right? I'll show you what's down there. 11.2%, that's everybody else, right? So 88.8%, if you go into an organization and you look around, you're gonna see some Tom Brady looking person, right? 11.2% is everybody else. So that is kind of a challenge in terms of how people, including yourself, think about what a leader looks like, right? Because that's what we're used to seeing. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about, this is really too loud, so I'm gonna ask the computer to lower the volume down to about 10%. All right, that's much better. That's all right, so we're going to do the river crossing challenge, which is about how do you get someone who, for whatever reason, doesn't believe you have the leadership skills to believe in your the leader. So I'm going to need two volunteers for this. And two volunteers. Let's go. All right, let's go. You guys, come on. Come on up here. All right. Look at the camera and tell everyone your name when you get up here. Manas Swen. Manas, come over here. BK. Okay. Okay, so Honest over here, on this side, over here. BK. Okay, so here's what's going on. Manas is over here, he's A. He's the one who says, I have a lot of executive presence. PK? PK is is PK. PK is the one who doesn't believe it, right? So Manas is over here saying, I have executive presence, I have leadership. 
DK, oh, it's me. <laughs> DK's over here saying, I don't believe it. Now, you see this river? Do you think DK's going to jump in and go over to where Manas is? You think that's going to happen? Nope. No. Manas, tell them all the reasons why you're such a great leader. Why? Give them the data. Just, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, tell them. I'm a great leader. Come on. Right? <laughs> Is he coming? No, no, he's not coming. Right? There's water here. It's dangerous. Why would you do that? Jump up and down. Jump up and down. Is he still coming? No, he's not going. Right? He's not going. Right? So, what? So they're on opposite sides. What would help Manus to get DK over to his side? What does he mean when there's this giant river? What does he mean? What could help him? A bridge. A bridge. Right? Great, a bridge, perhaps like that you could build here, put this down on the ground, and build the bridge over. Right? So it's a picture of a log. For those of you virtually, this is what Manas is building, right? So he's building a bridge that's gonna go over these dangerous rapids. Okay, great. So just imagine that reaches all the way, so you're over there. Now, PK, is it looking a little bit better now, a little safer? Not really. He's still <laughs> not buying it, but the bridge is there. Yeah. Now, what if Manus, Manus, go over halfway, right? He's halfway across the bridge. He's jump, jump up and down a little bit. It's, uh -huh. it's safe. PK, are you still going? Nah, <laughs> nah he's not going, right? Yeah. What does he need to do? Manus needs to go all the way. Come on, all, all the way, stand shoulder to shoulder, PK. Right now, notice, before they were facing each other. Manas was like, listen to me, listen to me. And BK was over here and was like, I don't see things the way you see them, because I'm over here on this side. But what's different now? Alicia, what's different now? Look at their, how they're standing. They're together. They're together. They're together. And so the communication is easier. And how are they facing? Are they facing opposite or the same no, way? same way. Right, so now Manas maybe sees things a little bit differently. Maybe he understands a little bit differently why BK may have some reservations. Whereas before, he was throwing data and statistics. Oh, I did this. I did that. You should like me because I'm handsome or smart or old or young or whatever. Right? Data doesn't do anything. But now he's over here and he sees, oh, that's why BK doubts me. Right? I can see from his perspective over here why he doesn't doubt me. And now, you can tell him, right, oh, I understand you're afraid of this or you're worried about this, and let me tell you why you should still choose me, right? And then finally, what can happen? They can come over, come on over. And guess what? Manus just got a promotion. All right, everybody. Yay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So you can see how people often think they make the mistake of thinking, oh, I did a lot of stuff, I did a lot of great stuff. They don't understand why they don't get selected. They use facts and figures. And often, people can tell you to do stuff. They say, do this. You need this, right? But it's a little bit of a shell game. If people don't actually have confidence in you to lead, it doesn't matter what certifications you have. It doesn't even matter if your boss tells you to do something and you do, let's say your boss tells you to do five things. Say, boss, I want to get promoted. And you come back. You do those five next year. And guess what happens at the end of the year? Maybe there's no promotion. And you're struggling. You're like, wait, wait. You told me to do these five things. Where is the promotion? Well, fact of the matter is, budgets and other reasons aside, if your boss still doesn't have confidence in your leadership, it doesn't matter that you did those five things, right? Maybe they thought that by doing those five things, they would perceive you differently, but for whatever reason they did. Right? So it's essential that people have confidence in your leadership. Now, here's a real challenge, going back to the Tom Brady College. Right? Am I ever going to be an NFL star quarterback or even look remotely like one? No. no. Am I going to get plastic surgery or wear a costume? So I should. No, I'm not going to, and I shouldn't have to. Right? So there's a problem here, though. You hear a lot about authenticity, and I'm a huge fan of authenticity, so don't get this wrong. But sometimes when you're authentic, 
What happens? Sometimes when you're authentic, what happens to us? You're trying to be really authentic, and what do you hear back sometimes? It's a criticism. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, I don't like the way you do that, or you know, you're wasting time doing that, and all of a sudden you're confused. You're like, wait a second. I was told to be authentic. I'm being myself, but now I'm being told I should only be myself as much as you want me to be myself, but I can't be truly myself, right? So what's going on here? I like to call that the code of authenticity. Why do some people get to be more authentic and others not, and how can we get to power ourselves more? Because that spark that I talked about in the beginning, you don't want to diminish that, you don't want to change that for anybody. That is your power right there, that is your authenticity. But you also don't want to limit your career when you're being yourself and everyone's like, we don't like you, right? So there's a code, right? There's a code. How do you sort of square that? So I'm going to go over something called the Sundubu test, right? Uh, so Sundubu is a Korean dish, it's a spicy dish, and I love it, and I will admit it stinks, right? <laughs> you bring this into work, if you heat this up, you are going to get some nasty looks, right? It don't smell like pizza, it doesn't even smell like microwave popcorn, which I can't stand the smell of. It's not a smell you would be familiar with if you never had this food before, right? But it's delicious to me. I love it, right? So let's say you uh, take a business trip or a personal trip, you go to South Korea, you go to Seoul, and you sample this dish and you love it. You're like, ah, oh, this is amazing. Come back to America, you find a local Korean restaurant that makes this, you get a big keeping bowl of this and you take some home and you want to have some leftovers for lunch tomorrow. And then you go into the pantry and you heat this thing up and you are staking up the whole office. Now, one important point, you are brand new to the office, it's your first day on the job, right? Now people coming into the pantry and they're like, what is that smell, right? What is their reaction going to be to you cheating that food up? Honestly, what is their reaction going to be? I don't like it. I don't like it, <laughs> right? They're going to say, I don't like it, right? Now, as you're thinking, this is the food I like, right? Why can't I heat the food up that I like? Why do you get to decide which food gets heated up, and I don't get to heat up my food. It's food, right? I'm not heating up fertilizer, right? It's food that pe millions of people enjoy, right? Now, let's change that for a second. Let's say it's not you heating up the food. Let's say you're a famous astronaut. You're Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin is in the pantry heating up Sundubu. People come in and they see Buzz Aldrin. What is their reaction going to be, Chris? Is it going to be different? Quite possibly. They're going to find out what it is. Yeah, all of a sudden it's like, oh, what is Buzz, Buzz Aldrin eating? <laughs> right? What if it's this guy? Right? Chris Hadfield. Right? Played the guitar, social media sensation, Canadian astronaut. What if it's him? Oh, loved your David Bowie rendition. Right? Playing the guitar in space, he made this great music video. Right? What is their reaction going to be? Yeah, they might even want to try it. Exactly. They're like, oh, it, it smells kind of weird, but Chris Hatfield's having it. Maybe I should trust him. Hey, Chris, you mind scooping me up a tiny little bowl of it? And Chris says, oh, it's pretty spicy, so be careful. What's the difference between when it was you and it was a world famous astronaut, or let's say you were the you were at that organization for many years and well known and well loved, and so you would get similar reactions to Facebook? What's the difference last year? Reputation, right? What else? What's their feeling towards you? Yeah, exactly. That that known familiarity, unknown. And though that's all right. The way I like to describe it is admiration. Yeah, respect, admiration. So all of that kind of boils down into connection. When someone feels strongly connected to you, then all those weird little things that annoyed them before they knew you all of a sudden are cute, or interesting, or novel, versus a total stranger or someone that I know, I'm like, that person's so annoying. Same thing you're heating up. Different connection. 
different relationship. So that's what a lot of people miss about authenticity. It's not just about, hey, I'm just bringing everything as I am. It's, well, do people actually know you? Do they feel connected to you? Because the way I like to describe it is when you have very high connection with someone, your authenticity is an asset. It's an asset. Interesting, innovative, novel, new. What is it when your connection is low? What is your authenticity? What's the opposite of an asset? Like Liability. Now it's used against you. Can you believe this guy, Chris Zelenka, is always heating up this stinky food? Who does this guy think he is? Right? It's the same food, right? But if it's Nick, who everyone loves, I mean, people don't like Chris, but they love Nick. They're like, Nick. Oh, it's Nick. He's always bringing like this funky, cool new cuisine to work. You know, it smells weird, but it tastes great. Like, yeah, Nick, recommend me a restaurant. Chris, go away. Right? What's the difference? It's the same food. It's the same food, but it's the connection. Right? So that's what changes the difference between the code of authenticity. Is it an asset or is it a liability? What I would say is, connection is a two-way street, but which part of the street do you control? Right? Now, you may see Chris one day and think, oh, he reminds me of my college roommate or my brother or something, and you will extend yourself if you extend your hand and you get to know him, and all of a sudden he becomes this great guy and not the guy who keeps up the sticky food. But Chris can't control that. All Chris can control is, hey, there's this really cool woman at work. She helps me out when I come in in the morning. I want to ask her about her day, get to know her a little bit better, and become friends. Right? So Chris can only control Chris. Right? We've all had people. We wouldn't be here if there weren't people who extended themselves to us, gave us chances. Right? But we didn't control that. They did that because they saw something in us or they wanted to, I don't know why. You may never know why they did that. Thank thankfully, they did. But what you can control is how you connect to other people, right? what you do to go out to connect. It looks like you have Some of the things I always talk about is a sense of vulnerability, right, to be real. I like to use the metaphor of armor. Uh, we all like to feel strong and look good and we put on that armor, right? But think about two knights trying to hug each other with their armor on, right? You can't connect, right? They're protected, right? No one's going to get them with a sword. But when the armor comes off, you're vulnerable, right? Now it's just, you got nothing protecting you. And that vulnerability enables you and that other person to make a real connection. Not, oh, you know, look at... What I did on this project, you know, I did this on this project. Oh, aren't we all so great? Right? Versus, you know, I had a little trouble with this. You know, maybe you could give me some advice, or I've been struggling with this issue at home, and maybe they have a similar issue, and now you bond. Right? Over the vulnerability. Curiosity, right? When you're naturally curious about people. Not for any agenda, but you're just like, oh, it's kind of interesting. I'm curious. It's a funny thing happens. People become curious about you. You're curious about them, and they become curious about you, even though they're the one doing all the talking. Something happens because it's a human being thing, it's a reciprocity. That's how we how we're geared to as a social uh, organism. Right? So there are definitely lots of things you can do to connect. I think the challenge is, how many people do I connect to at my desk? Right? This is a wonderful opportunity. I'm getting one, two, three, four, about 10 of you, before there are other people. We're getting to connect person to person. It's a wonderful opportunity. And even people virtually, we're connecting virtually, right? But you don't connect sitting alone in your room, staring at a spreadsheet, right? You're not connecting with anyone. So there's definitely time you need to do that heads down work, but there's also times you need to put your head up and connect with people, because otherwise you're going to be the one eating up the stinky food, not the delicious food. Any other questions? Donna, why don't you 
you're asking me a difficult question. Okay. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the answer to that is probably worth a billion dollars. You can sell that to like all the Fortune 500 companies, but it's, it's a wonderful question, right? I mean, it's a real question. And it again goes to, you know, you show up and organizations I feel, uh, many of them are uh, sincerely asking you to do that, right? But then when you do that, Maybe some of the people you report to or some of the people you see that don't actually respond in the way that you would expect. Um, and it's not a cure-all, but again, I, I go back to the connection. The more connected you are with people, the better those things will be received. Um, it's definitely a challenge if you just come into a situation and say, nobody knows me, I haven't proven anything, and everyone should just think I'm wonderful, because that's who I am. That usually doesn't get you far in school, in work, in social circles, right? There's that trust that's built up, there's that appreciation uh, that happens. Um, and I think here's the magic, here's where the magic is for that. When you are connected to someone, they begin to see you not as a category or as part of a group, but as a human being. And here's something interesting. I might see you, Donna, differently, but every other white woman of a certain age, I still have my biases against them, right? But you and I, we're good, right? Because we know each other. But to me, that's the first step to say, wait a second, if God is like this, maybe I need to reevaluate, even if I'm not doing it like intentionally, maybe it's like subconscious, I'm thinking, wait a second, maybe I got it wrong. God has showed me that some of my biases or my interpretations are off. That's the first step. But it doesn't happen that the whole group comes in, it's like, boom. Everyone thinks the group is great. It happens individually, person to person. And it goes from that. Bill. Well, empathy is so key that we can see things the way other people see them because that allows the connection, right? And I think that's a challenge for all leaders as they move higher up. I mean, it's been documented that we begin to sort of forget some of the other things at the lower levels because we're operating here now, right? So it can be hard to be empathetic and connect with things that are like so many years behind you and so many levels below you, right? But the ability to do that really creates the trust. And I would say, in addition to empathy, I would go one step further, compassion, right? Compassion, like empathy is like, I see, um, I see Phil, you're stuck under a rock, right? And I say, oh, I too, Phil, know what, it's, what it feels like to be stuck under a rock. That's terrible. And then I walk away. You're still under the rock. I feel it. Compassion is wanting to help you and say, you know what, Phil, I'm going to pick up the rock. Les, come over here. Kim, come on, let's get the rock off of Phil. That's compassion, right? knowing how people feel and also wanting to relieve suffering. And that is also transformative because empathy is kind of a, a double-edged sword. You can be empathetic and very manipulative too, right? That happens a lot at work, like bosses love insecure high performance, right? Because you can milk every last ounce of work from them. You know, you give them a little bit of a look and say, oh, that's it. And then they're working like 80 hours a week to try to please you, right? So empathy, like understanding how people feel and operate, can actually be used in a negative way based on the morality of the person who has the empathy. Whereas with compassion, you want to relieve the suffering for the good of the person, right? It's not for you, but it's because you care about the other person. So I think both empathy and compassion are things that leaders don't think about or use it up in a leadership toolkit. <laughs> great question, great question. So um, I'm really big on not subscribing to any particular rules, right? So the eye contact is a thing that happens. When you break eye contact, something happens. 
right? But I'm not going to tell you the rule is you have to stare at something. Because that something weird happens when you stare at someone without breaking eye contact too, right? They start to like back away, like I'm not, don't feel so, you know, secure here anymore. Um, so what I would say is it's great that you've noticed that and are aware of that. The important thing is, if you understand that eye contact plays a certain role and that your eye contact may not be similar to most people's eye contact, that's something you, you might tell someone. You're talking to a new boss, right? And you're going into your one-on-ones. And you're wondering why it's not going well. And you realize, oh, maybe it's the eye contact, right? You can tell your boss, like, look, boss, I just want to let you know that this is kind of the way my brain works. It's a little bit different. You know, when I'm breaking eye contact, it's not because I'm not paying attention, it's because I'm trying to come up with really good thoughts to share with you. So I just want to let you know. Right? So, otherwise you're struggling to become or do something that you're not, which is not healthy. Again, it goes to authenticity and your spark. You don't have to change your spark for other people, but you want to connect to people. You can go as much as you want. Um, I would say the number one thing is actually to not do anything, right? Because here's what happens, right? Because I used to uh, think about networking a lot, and I'm like a horrible networker, actually, right? Because what happens is, you know, you, you read some tips about what to do, and you go to do it, and everyone's like, who's this weirdo who's trying to, like, do something, right? It's, it's like it feels forced, right? So the number one thing you can do in terms of connect better is to actually be interested in other people, which is hard for some of us, right? Because we have our own problems, we have our own agenda. Maybe you were a firstborn male child in an Asian family, right? You get all the attention. You're not really thinking about other people. Maybe you're an only child and a baby of the family that got all the attention. It can be hard for some of us to generally be thinking, oh, you know, what's going on with you? We just want to talk about ourselves. And how does that connect? Right? You don't connect with people when you're just blabbering on about yourself. Right? So if you're honestly, genuinely interested in other people that just show up that way and do whatever that is, eye contact, dropping names, asking questions, whatever that is that you do as a genuinely interested person, that is actually much more powerful than tactics that you're trying to implement. You can do it if you're like a good actor, like you're George Clooney or something, but for most of us, it doesn't work. It's very fake. I mean, it will tell you, right? You go in front of a client, you try to put on a show, they know. They can smell it from like a mile away. It's, it's not natural, you know? So I'm going to end with a quick question. Who is Charles Bolden? Do you know who Charles Bolden is? Keeping with our NASA team. He's an astronaut. He's the fourth of 19 African-American astronauts to travel into space. And he was the administrator, the CEO of NASA for eight years. Right? He's a guy with executive presence. He's flown into space, and he's managed the organization that gets people into space. Really, really inspiring. So that's why I say all of us, unlimited potential, but you need what do you, what's inside you? What do you need? Spark. Right? And what's the effort? What is that? Fuel. That's the fuel. But then what's that third ingredient that executive presence helps you get? Opportunity. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone.